After a long gestation period of more than two billion years, suddenly 500 million years ago, there was an explosion of life in the sea, pulsating jellyfish, feathered stars. Then jet-propelled armored shells appeared, the ammonite and the nautilus, which ruled the seas long before the vertebrates. The nautilus alone survives today. For the sea's growing abundance, colonies of brilliant living coral became nurseries. Nature provided shelter for the hunted and pastures of plenty for hunting. Rhythms and balance were maintained, and for many millions of years, the sea's environment encompassed all life. From the oceans, plants and animals gradually moved onto land. The last creature to appear was man. A newcomer by the geological calendar, man the achiever, gifted with hands, a complex brain, and voice for communication, began to manipulate the environment of all living creatures. Throughout coastal zones of the world, sea life is today in jeopardy. Coral communities now become dusty tombstones of what was once a cradle of creation. In a South Pacific lagoon, Captain Cousteau and his divers now explore how 500 million years of life tries to cope with the onslaught. Here, in what was once an underwater garden of Eden, the serpent of the sea may soon be the sole survivor. sea, here in the Pacific, called by Darwin the oldest of existing oceans, survive the most primitive forms of underwater life. To study these rarely observed bottom-dwelling creatures, Cousteau has commissioned the vessel Pilu Pilu, now approaching the tropical island of New Caledonia. First glimpse of Noumea, capital of this French overseas territory, reveals a tropical paradise of slag and debris. Coral heads, once underwater, have been pushed up by the dumping of slag from strip mining and mineral refining to die in the searing sun. This industrialized area of the lagoon has been choked and destroyed. We wonder about the extent of the damage to the marine populations below, and especially to the almost legendary Nautilus which has quietly survived hundreds of millions of years. Cousteau divers will first assess damage done to the shallow bottom communities, a short distance from the concentrated contamination. Here at the shoreline, two worlds meet, land and sea. These shallow waters serve as a refuge for burrowing shore animals and are accessible for foraging creatures from the bottom of the lagoon. In this unique environment, one often overlooked, 
Chief Diver Dominique Sumian will evaluate the impact of mining contamination. The water in this cove is clear, but on the undersea desert there is an apparent absence of life. Suddenly, mysterious tracks of wandering marine animals. But where are the animals? Sumion flashes a weird mutation. Is it fish or bird? Then on the mud flats, the water turns turbid and Sumion discovers an intriguing series of burrowed holes. What manner of life survives under this sediment? The flat ocean plains provide no natural shelter. Evolution has produced animals who dig their homes in the soft bottom. They come out for food at night and retreat during daytime. How deep? How efficient is this underground architecture? On the deck of Pilu Pilu, a fast-setting plastic is prepared for use in a population density survey of the mud flat below. Plastic will be poured into the underwater holes to determine also what manner of shelter exists for the mysterious foragers. Plastic, slightly heavier than seawater, will slowly sink into the holes, solidify and form a mold of the animal's burrows to reveal the structure of their hidden habitats. Soon we find ourselves in a snowstorm under the sea, and the plastic flakes stick to our hair, our skin, our suits. We will be obliged to wash the plastic out of our hair with paint remover which we will discover is also skin remover. But Philippe does not consider our miscalculations a joke. He thinks only of the cost of the damaged suits and clogged diving gear. <laughs> the next phase of the operation will be to remove the plastic from the mud. <laughs> It is time to extract the quickly setting plastic molds. They will be blown free of silt by an improvised high output water hose. The hosing to free the molds also beneficially plows up food stored on the ocean floor and recharges the area with oxygen. As they are uncovered, the molds display complicated shapes of strange beauty. Philippe retrieves a mold of amazing form and proportions. 
it could be exhibited in a museum of modern art. Under each square foot of bottom, there are two feet of ten. Obviously, there are many types of residents in this complicated maze of burrows, secret catacombs, and escape routes. Here is proof that despite growing mineral deposits, under the mud, there still exists a considerable bottom community. A mold city. The plastic forms have been turned upside down to graphically illustrate the weird realm below. We would try to discover who are the hosts of this desolate seabed and who are the hunters that make the lookouts and escape trenches necessary in these hidden habitats. We would dive at night At nightfall, divers led by Philippe Cousteau get ready to explore and film the animal night shift below. Diving at night in this lagoon is not particularly dangerous, but there is always a special mood on deck when we get ready for a night dive. Equipment is checked and double checked. In a black world of uncertainty and limited vision, the prospect of discovery has a special flavor. Still unknown is how severely marine life here has been affected by careless shore mining. A lone stingray prowls the bottom undulates away from lights into the concealing gloom. Tracks suggest that some unknown creature has passed here, seeking food or shelter. The trail winds through a small school of goatfish slumbering in the mud. There are goat-like whiskers or feelers used to sense and dig out their minute prey. A marauding starfish covets a queen's color. By snapping shut her two valves, the scallop swims away by jet propulsion. Evolution has engineered every conceivable survival skill. A tiny octopus whose ancestors gave up their shells millions of years ago, now seeks the security of an empty cockle shell to escape nocturnal flesh eaters. The infant waddles off, carrying with him his adopted home. If an octopus is a little shrimp and threatened, he'll crawl into any shell and climb up. From his hunting hole, a mantis shrimp discovers a diver. Perhaps the boldest creature of the bottom community, he investigates. The shrimp finds our diver inedible. endless struggle for survival, strange partnerships form. At this hole, a goby, a small fish with good eyesight, stands guard while a nearly blind bulldozer shrimp builds their shared home.
other desert dwellers devour their neighbors. A deceptive animal that looks like a plant draws a fish to its mouth. When this creature feels threatened, it disappears into the bottom. In this increasingly befouled environment, nighttime creepers suddenly emerge as if awakening from molding graves and forage under cover of night. The sea mice move across the mud flats like a battalion of tanks, ravaging everything in their path, the dead, the dying, the contaminated. Toxins will concentrate in their bodies and they will pass them on to higher forms when they themselves are eaten. A sea snake. This survivor hunts in the holes of the hidden world. For the vulnerable residents, hiding is a way of life. Security is unknown. In nature's remorseless cycle, there are few natural deaths. Diver and snake confront each other on this barren battlefield of mineral dust. We would like to know more about this serpent who ages ago returned from land to the ocean of his origin to prey on the tiny bottom dwellers. He now seems to thrive in this recently contaminated water world. Aboard the Pilu Pilu, cameramen and crew rest under the tropical sun, which bathes and renews the coral sea. Land creatures from halfway around the world, they are obliged to change their clocks in order to dive at night, the only time they can observe the nocturnal residents of this endangered South Pacific lagoon. Destination is a strip mining area where the men will investigate damage to reef life. As they make their way through treacherous coral heads, sea snakes are sighted, rising to the surface. Some might say that according to legend, they have been drawn by the music of Praslin's guitar, while in fact they are air breathers and have come to the surface to replenish their oxygen supply. The divers descend to study these reptiles, first encountered on the mud flats at night. Information about the sea viper from local residents and fishermen has been fragmentary, laced with hearsay and folklore. To gather more detailed information about their habits, Cousteau's team initiates the use of a new underwater zoom lens camera. A sea snake swims defiantly under Sumian. Then hunts for small prey, its forked tongue exploring for food. At last the hunter has found a victim, which he slowly consumes.
Wearing a rebreather, Sumion follows the sea snake as it surfaces to quickly refill its long, single lung. In a split second, the sea snake can inhale enough oxygen to sustain it for eight hours. Thrusting with its paddle-like tail, the snake continues his search for food. Bulges in his body reveal successful hunting. Ruler of the reef, the serpent is ordinarily a solitary hunter, but this male is now joined by a female. During the mating season, sea snakes, like other species, appear to become even more aggressive toward intruders. During courtship and breeding, paired off snakes intertwine sensually in the water. Legends about the snake abound. According to Plutarch, Alexander the Great was sired by one. Captain Cousteau would seek more reliable information about the sea snake and its proliferation in this area from toxicologist Dr. Bruce W. Halstead. A team of Calypso divers is exploring the lagoon all around the island of New Caledonia. And we are everywhere meeting many snakes, poisonous snakes from many varieties. And uh, we suppose we are in the heart of poisonous snake country. Yes, I would say that you are. If we look at the total distribution of the sea snakes, we find that there's only one species, the yellow belly, that extends eastward to Panama. And then we, picked up, we pick up about 51 species here in the Indo-Pacific region, and many of these extend westward onto the Persian Gulf. But within the New Caledonia area, I would estimate that we have probably 30 to 40 species. Well... We meet so many snakes that probably more snakes than there ever was because the fishermen from New Caledonia told us that they were more rare in the past. And I wonder if this has anything to do with the tremendous pollution due to the industrialization of the island because the marine animals in the lagoon are stuff choked by, by uh, deposits and poison and uh, the sea snakes breathe air they have lungs, they don't have gills. So I wondered if they could not resist better and take advantage of it. I think that this uh, has to do with the part of the overall uh, marine environmental pollution picture today. Because we're finding that uh, many different uh, species, the more hardy ones, are tending to reproduce and become more abundant while the more delicate forms are gradually disappearing. And possibly this is the picture that you're finding here in terms of the sea snake. Reports on sea snakes from islanders have misled Cousteau divers and cameramen, now preparing to collect and classify the various species here. According to these reports, the venomous reptiles are unable to open their mouths wide enough to inflict bites on humans. You'll notice that the jaws of this snake can be widely distended so that they have no difficulty in circling a finger or a toe. Now the potency of the venom here is 10 times that of the king cobra. So it's a very dangerous poison. It acts both on the nervous system and it also tends to degenerate the muscles. Well, you know, we had a hard time trying to get the truth from the, the natives because there is so much superstition going on. Well, it's because of the superstition that uh, we do not have reliable data on what is really the incidence of uh, snake, sea snake poisoning. For example, if a pregnant woman is uh, she talks about a sea snake, she feels that she may be bitten by one and die. If a fisherman talks about one, he knows these snakes may become very aggressive and kill him. In collecting sea snakes for study, if a diver makes one mistake, he could soon be dead. Our divers are cautious, but they underestimate the flexibility and the formidable weapons of this cobra of the sea.
Fortunately this time, the snake's short fangs did not penetrate the diver's gloves, and the collecting continues. A snake may decide to withhold his venom. It is a capability peculiar to the sea serpent, which may allow it to conserve its lethal poison for a death struggle. The most dangerous phase of capture is maneuvering the strong, supple reptile into the basket and closing the lid before the reluctant snake can strike. If he is so determined to escape, he must have a good reason, and we let him go his way, as we go ours. Late in the afternoon, Pilu Pilu continues down the New Caledonia Lagoon, toward the reef below the strip mining area. Mountains, gouged and ravaged by machines for inexpensive high-grade ore. Plant cover has been destroyed. Tropical rains have washed the red clay into the sea. Come nightfall, Captain Cousteau and divers descend to the coral reef below to see how the reef and the life it supports are withstanding the onslaught. In midwater, the darkness is suddenly spangled by segmented sea worms and undulating sea slugs attracted to our lights. They are like serpentine streamers from New Year's Eve's past, darting from the darkness and engulfing us. It is a surprise along the way, a fascinating psychedelic display that gives no hint of what we may find below. Off the scarred shores of New Caledonia, Captain Cousteau descends to the coral reef adjacent to the mining area above. What is a dumping ground to some is a home to others. Here the corpses of sponges, plants, corals, fettled to the ocean floor, unable to flee, they lie suffocated and buried. Mineral deposits blanket the bottom, toxic even for the almost indestructible sea cucumber grabbing through this graveyard. The miraculous cradle of life has been demeaned to a disposal system. 
but above the surface and under the water. It is one world and it is vulnerable everywhere. The dive continues in deeper waters. The more sophisticated forms, the reef fishes that could escape their environment, still hover near home. What he lost to the world would be the zebra surgeon fish. He searches for food through this seal trap that was once a garden of living coral. Waste particles on top also take their toll on the bottom by cutting off the sunlight vital to the cycle of life. Over the ages, in their drive to live, creatures have developed remarkable defenses. Here, a parrot fish has spun a translucent, poisonous cocoon to keep out predators while he sleeps. With its strong jaws, the parrot fish chews living coral. After ingesting the nutrients, it spits out sand, thus manufacturing shelter for burrowing animals. But when all the coral is gone, where goes the powered fish? This suspension feeder, a plant-like animal, collects and draws to its mouth whatever filters down from above. An associated little fish gobbles up the leavings. This exotic resident of these quiet coral sand bottoms, licking its tentacles of poisons as well as nutrients, may disappear from the sea, as throughout the world, man-made changes in landforms contribute to the downfall of our marine ecosystem. The lazy, squirting sea hare expert in chemical warfare. His defensive purple cloud keeps off his natural enemies, but gives him no protection against the heavy toxic metals as he scrounges along the bottom. We meet an old friend, the octopus. He changes color in a blink. But how long can this master of the art of camouflage survive here until the time men of conscience come to the aid of their partners in the sea? Cousteau and cameramen dive to a still deeper shelf along the outer reef they meet the totally unexpected. In between two worlds, ours and the abyssal depth, a solitary nautilus has come up to feed. We can scarcely believe it. Here is the object of our original quest, the elusive survivor of hundreds of millions of years beneath the sea. Shy of flight, it turns away from us 
and swings rhythmically towards its secret home in the depths. Studied mostly in shell and fossil form, here at last in the wild is the living animal, a living fossil. We have an appointment with him. On one of Caledonia's coral islands, Captain Cousteau searches for nautilus shells with the most notable of nautilus authorities, Dr. Anna Bitter of the University of Cambridge. Yes, but that happened while he was alive. We find a dwelling of unsurpassed beauty. While growing in size, the living nautilus moved from chamber to chamber and built this graceful coral. We look upon millions of years of engineering perfection. The expedition moves back to the deep waters of the outer reef. The shell found on the beach undoubtedly drifted in from these shoals. The meeting between Nautilus and man is only possible at a special point in depth and time. After nightfall, the Nautilus comes up from unknown depths of perhaps 2,000 feet. But he never voluntarily swims higher than 125 feet. In our descent, we must meet the Nautilus within our diving limit of 200 feet. It is a chancy meeting at best. Captain Cousteau leads the dive down to the first shelf and then beyond. Here at the edge of open sea, the waters seem to have remained almost pollution-free. A giant grouper balefully surveys the approaching divers, then moves on. The descent continues, and then, out of the gloom, a nautilus appears. A nautilus in his natural environment. Fascinated, I watch him pulse his jet, as he has done since 500 million years, unchanged, while other species evolved around him. The Nautilus is again affected by the lights, and attempts to retreat. In flight, he moves toward Cousteau, When he is manipulated to change his direction, the Nautilus persists in reversing his field and keeps heading toward the depths, displaying an uncanny sense of direction. Cousin of the octopus, the Nautilus propels itself with a flap-like funnel. Two of the animals will be collected for further observation by Cousteau and Dr. Bitter in the ship's aquarium. You know, Dr. Bitter, for us European divers, these animals are more or less fabulous. We have been dreaming about them, huh, Philippe, and we knew they existed, but we had never seen them because they live so far away from Europe. And also, they seem to be from another age. Aren't they a little bit of that? Indeed, yes, I have your feeling too. When I came across the world to look at them, I felt I was looking at a living fossil, and indeed that is what we are looking at, aren't we? It's a living fossil. Here, these unchanged, virtually unchanged, since the chalk was laid down. You have shells of Nautilus from those days, 
not different from these. That's how many million years? Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> it's a lot of million years. It's a lot of million years. We hadn't watched them. We hadn't looked at them. We hadn't had the chance of seeing them. Because they are, uh, it's rare to get uh, some alive. You look at this strange impersonal eye and you wonder what image it can give the animal and what the animal can understand from that image. And we just don't know. The chambered nautilus shell found on the beach by Cousteau and Dr. Bitter has been cut in half, and we see the outer chamber which once housed the living animal. We can see everything. We can see the chambers, each one a sealed compartment, and running through this tube, which is chalky as far as we can see, but inside, you see the little hole yeah. here, that is from the animal, a tube of living animal going right through. And it is by that tube of living animal the buoyancy is controlled. By pumping water in, they compress the gas and make the thing just a little heavier. By withdrawing liquid, they let the gas expand and give it the extra buoyancy. As night again descends on the outer reef, new equipment is checked for a special Nautilus dive. Philippe Cousteau adjusts the lens of a new invention for observation in near darkness, the light multiplying owl eye. In a test, it is aimed at the lighthouse at the entrance of Noumea Pass, and then ship's lights are turned out. In the dark of the moon, the lighthouse is revealed, and the owl eye amplifies 10,000 times the light of the beacon. It will now be used to observe the Nautilus without bright lights, so as not to disturb the animal's behavior. The owl eye is used in almost complete darkness for undetected observation. Accompanying lights will be turned on only for photography. We surprise a giant spiny lobster roaming the reef, making its living at night. The lobster brings us luck. As we follow it with our lights, not one, but two nautiluses are suddenly discovered. For the moment, the owl eye is not needed. Then the nautiluses separate. They are fleeing the lights. Slow moving, but controlling its vertical motion with built-in ballast tanks, the nautilus is a sort of living bathyscaphe. It can descend to 2,000 feet without its shell being crushed and it can rise and sink at will. I now observe the Nautilus with the owl eye. The right light removed, the animal swims normally, rhythmically. The visor above its eyes reminds us of the helmeted knights of old. The Nautilus swims directly over us unafraid and is again joined by its partner. Another Nautilus is discovered making off with a fish. Through independent nervous control, tentacles surrounding the mouth operate in specialized sets. One outer set tells the animal about the world around it. The middle set smells and finds food and then enwraps the prey. Inner hidden tentacles take the food from these and draw it to the mouth, where the Nautilus, like the octopus, bites its food into bits with its black parrot-like beak. We now find our two Nautiluses in mating embrace an act of their life never before observed in the wild, but certainly occurring in the dark depth these many millions of years. It somehow brings into pathetic focus what is now imperiled, 500 million years of heartbeats beneath the sea. The nuptials are attended by many small crustaceans attracted to our lights. 
The wedding of the Nautilus is an instinctive promise of continuance. But pollutants carried by currents know no boundaries in the oceans of the world. The mated female now returns to the depths. No one knows where she lays her eggs or where the young grow. No living juvenile Nautilus has ever been found. Perhaps the less we know about the Nautilus, the greater its chances in this age of growing appetite for short-sighted gains. There is demand for the beautiful, rare shell. If man knew better how and where to catch the Nautilus, there would be no future for this living fossil, this riddle of the sea, who now whirls through a milky way of colliding creatures to the temporary security of depth and darkness. In the reflective calm of the Coral Sea, 85 miles from the underwater wastelands created by the encroachment of man, Philippe Cousteau embarks on an aerial reconnaissance. Work in the New Caledonia Lagoon with the Nautilus and with the endangered bottom dwellers of the contaminated reef has been completed. Here it is a relief to look down upon unspoiled coral outcroppings, waters clear and pure. Beneath the sunlit surface of our healthy coral, our divers enjoy swimming once more in harmony with teeming schools of fish. Science has all the answers to keep the waters of the world clean. We all know that upon man depends the fate of our troubled oceans and of our planet. And it is in the oceans that lies the fate of man and of all living creatures. <laughs> 